I'm in Naples in southern Italy and behind me is Mount Vesuvius and the city of Naples is very much in the shadow of that volcano and I'm in Italy to find out more about volcanoes to find out about the impact of the volcanoes on the landscapes and also to see how volcanoes have shaped the lives of the people who live here. In this film I'll be travelling across southern Italy to explore volcanoes in the Bay of Naples, Sicily and the Aeolian Islands. I'll be climbing the volcanoes and exploring the area with expert guides. I'll be talking to local people and scientists about the opportunities and challenges of living in the shadow of Italy's volcanoes. Italy sits at the boundary of two massive tectonic plates, the African plate to the south and the Eurasian plate to the north. The enormous pressures at this margin have resulted in numerous fault lines and frequent powerful earthquakes. In the western Mediterranean, a kink in the plate margin marks the line of a subduction zone. Here, the dense African plate is subducting beneath the Eurasian plate. It's a highly complex, destructive plate margin that triggers devastating earthquakes and creates some of Europe's most dangerous volcanoes, such as Mount Vesuvius and Mount Etna. My first port of call is Mount Vesuvius, just a few kilometres to the east of Naples. I'm going to meet up with local guide Paolo Mazzarella to find out more about the volcano and the threat that it poses to the neighbouring city of Naples. So Paolo, this is Naples? It is. And how many people live here roughly? Well, in Naples the city 1.5 million, but if we include all the surroundings it's about uh, 3 million people. Ah, that's a lot of people. So if there is a warning of an eruption, how many people would be evacuated from the area? Well, according to the evacuation plan that exists, there are about 300,000. That's going to be quite a challenge because the roads in Naples are pretty narrow, aren't they? Oh, they are, and the villages around it are even narrower. So it's going to be tough, really. So how do the people um, in, in, uh, in Naples, you know, living with this constant threat of volcanoes, how, how does that affect their daily lives? Are they, are they worried about that? I can tell you that um, the result of all this is a lifestyle which is totally different from anyone else. I mean, people go very easily around, you know. They try to enjoy every moment of their life because um, unconsciously they don't know what is going to happen the day after. So they try to leave the moment. The most famous historic eruption of Mount Vesuvius occurred in AD 79. It wiped out the nearby cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum and killed over a thousand people. The violent eruption lasted for two days, spewing rocks, ash and gas high up into the atmosphere. As these vast columns of ash and rocks collapsed, they sent devastating pyroclastic surges down the mountainside, burying Pompeii and Herculaneum. Scientists have estimated that during these pyroclastic surges, temperatures would have exceeded 300 degrees Celsius. Vesuvius lies on a destructive plate margin, where the African plate is subducting and melting beneath the Eurasian plate. Beneath Italy, the lower part of the African plate has broken away, leaving a slab window. Scientists believe that this affects the chemistry of the magma, which together with the unusually high water content, accounts for the explosive activity associated with Mount Vesuvius. The highly viscous, silica-rich magma partly solidifies as it rises through the volcano, causing immense pressure to build up underneath. It is the release of this pressure, like the popping of a champagne cork, that triggers the mountain's characteristic violent eruptions. So I'm walking up, uh, up quite a steep footpath now, up to the crater itself of Vesuvius. I'm really interested to find out what, uh, what's happening in the crater. I'm going to be meeting an expert up there who's going to tell me a little bit more about what's happening. So Roberto, I gather you're a guide up here. Can you tell me a bit more about what you do? Yes, Simon. I've been uh, doing the guide up here since um, 17 years now. And uh, it's a very nice job for me, uh, living on the edge of an active volcano. Tell me a bit about uh, the crater uh, and what's happening now with the crater. It's not completely inactive, is it? There's some steam over the far side. Well, as, as you can see, uh, we have uh, steaming activities all around the edge. So places where the temperature is very hot, between 75 and 95 degrees centigrade. So the volcano is only dormant, but is active and dangerous. And, it, and the last eruption was in 1944. And am I right that the eruption took place here from this very crater? 
Exactly right, Simon. Uh, the eruption started from here. Imagine that before the eruption started, the crater was actually full up to the edge, and we see a very thick layer of lava here, and that's the lava from 1944. So lava flew from here, went down in the valley, and destroyed part of two towns, San Sebastiano and Massa di Sopra. Along with all volcanoes in southern Italy, Mount Vesuvius is very carefully monitored by scientists. So, Roberto, can you tell me a little bit about how this volcano then is monitored? Well, uh, as you know, um, Simon, we have a local institute which is called Osservatorio Vesuviano. That's the oldest institute of volcanology in the world it's, uh, since 1845. It's down there. Basically, they take care of the um, temperature and composition of the gases of the fumaroles. They study the seismic activity and they study also the deformations of the volcano. Okay. These are the main parameters. Right, so, so what they're looking for is some sort of is, is a change. So they're looking for changes in the temperatures, uh, warming up, they're looking for uh, particular concentrations of gas, I guess, and, and, and looking also for maybe the, the volcano starts to swell, um, and, and earthquakes would suggest that the magma was starting to rise. You're right, Simon. Um, in fact, uh, the magmatic chamber of the volcano at the moment is very deep, from 8 to 10 kilometers. So in case the magma is coming up, will cause many changes in these main parameters. More temperature, more gases coming out, many uh, shaking, many earthquakes, and of course the mountain is likely to swell or to deform itself anyway. And the fact that it was 1944 is, is quite a long time ago. Um, is the volcano overdue to erupt? Well, uh, that's, that's uh, you, you got the point, Simon, because the volcano uh, can be quite for a very long period, but then eventually at the end we get uh, something much more powerful. That's the problem for this volcano. So the big worry, I, I suppose, is then that the next time it does erupt, it's likely to be a big one. Exactly. They expect the next eruption to be uh, an eruption explosive with these pyroclastic flows. That's, that's a, a very uh, dramatic situation for a lot of people. To find out more about threats to the area from volcanic eruptions, I'm off to the centre of Naples to investigate a network of tunnels deep below the city's streets. This extraordinary place is called Napoli Souterranea, Naples underground. 40 metres above my head is the centre of the city of Naples. It's really hard to believe that down here. The reason why these huge caverns and tunnels are here is because back about 2,400 years ago, the Greeks dug up the rocks from here to make the city um, that, that, is, uh, that is above my head. And then the Romans came along subsequently and they used this area as a massive underground kind of reservoir system with, with aqueducts and so on, um, providing water for the, for the growing city. The reason I'm down here is because the rock that makes up this area uh, is in fact a volcanic rock called a tuff. But that particular rock was erupted from a volcano about 12,000 years ago, from the Campi Flegri range. And so what that kind of tells us is that Naples, the city that is now above all this volcanic rock, is clearly still in a danger area from a future eruption. I'm on my way to Solfaterra. It's part of the Campi Flegri volcanic area, and it's just a few kilometers to the west of Naples. And I'm really looking forward to finding out more about it. I'm in the crater of a dormant volcano, and if you were here with me, you would smell very, very strong sulphur fumes in the air. And to find out a little bit more about this crater, my guide Daniela is going to show me around. On the floor of the crater are a number of bubbling mud pools, a testimony to the considerable heat that lurks just below the ground surface. Elsewhere in the crater, there are some spectacular steaming vents. So, Daniela, what is, what's happening here? It's a fumarole, the largest fumarole in the crater. It's a very impressive feature. How would it have been formed? It's a crack in the ground from which hot steam comes out. And the colours that we've got here, what, what would those colours be? It's sulphur and rialga. Rialga is a kind of sulphur, uh, sulphur and arsenic. And the sulphur itself, um, that was mined here in the past, wasn't it? What did they use the sulphur for? In the past, it was important to make gunpowder and fertilizer. I mean, it's, uh, it really is a very impressive feature being so close to it. It's rather like a, a very angry kettle. Not only was the crater mined for valuable minerals, 
but the heat was exploited for therapeutic and healing purposes. Daniela, can you tell me something about this building? Well, Seymour, they are stufe, which means sauna. So that's like a sweating room? Yes, sweating room. OK, and I notice there are two sort of entrances here. Why are there two? The difference was about the temperature. That one behind you, we called it the hell because the temperature is about 90 degrees Celsius. The other one is the purgatory with 60 degrees Celsius. I can certainly feel the heat from hell here, that's for, that's for sure. The, the building itself was used uh, in the past for health benefits, I believe. Yes, because uh, this team was considered really good for respiratory disorders. So that helps people to breathe more easily. And the building also, I notice, has got various crystals and minerals on the edge of it too. And uh, I can see there's some sulphur here, some yellow sulphur, and also some of the white um, mineral too. What, what is the white? White is alum. In the past, it was, uh, was important to fix uh, colours in fabrics. Really? Wow. So this particular building, it's a, a fascinating building, isn't it? I'm told that if you drop a boulder on the ground beneath me, it makes a booming sound. So I'm just going to try it out with this boulder here. It's pretty heavy, I have to tell you. And I'm going to drop it and see what happens. Yeah, an impressive noise that makes, an impressive sound. Daniela, can you explain to me why that makes such a loud boom? Well, Simon, because this ground is porous. So it's, uh, it's got lots of holes in it and that makes the sound travel and creates like a drum sound. Yeah. Very impressive. <laughs> it was fascinating to spend time with Daniela, learning more about the features and human uses of Solfaterra. With its bubbling mud pools, steaming vents and bright mineral deposits, it's easy to see why this is a popular attraction for tourists and local school groups. Solfaterra is just one of several volcanic features in the Campi Flegri volcanic area, a vast caldera or collapsed crater. It's from here that the tuff we saw earlier in Naples was erupted. The caldera contains over 20 individual craters, some of which have become filled with water to form crater lakes. Daniela wants to show me the largest of these, the Lago d'Averno. Daniela, this looks like uh, another volcanic crater. Well, Simon, this is a Lago d'Averno, Averno Lake. And over to one side, in, in, the, in the distance there, looks like another volcano, is that right? Yes, that's Monte Nuovo, new mountain. It was formed in 1538 in one week. I suppose what it proves, though, is that this whole area is very, very active volcanically and that uh, a new volcano could form almost anywhere at almost any time. Just along the coast is the town of Puzzuoli, where there is some rather unusual evidence of tectonic activity. So we're in the, uh, the centre now of, of Pozzuoli, Daniela, and, and this is a really impressive looking Roman remain here. This was a Roman market with shops surrounding. And the, and the importance of it in terms of, of tectonics is that it shows the effect that's known as, as Brady Seism, which is the idea of rising and falling of the land. Um, and this is really one of the very few places in the world where, where it's clearly evident. And uh, what you can see here is that the, the lower portions of some of these columns have actually got signs of marine life. And even though today, this is above the sea level. In the past, this would have been flooded by seawater and the marine life, the animals in the sea, would actually have uh, lived on some of these columns. This is a, a rather strange feature, but it's very clear evidence of the fact that the area is affected by this rising and falling as the, as the magma rises and falls under the ground and it's pushing the land up and then it sinks down again and it, it rises up and so on and uh, that's again very clear evidence that this whole area is, is still tectonically active. Campi Flegri is a fascinating area with its crater lakes, bubbling mud pools and evidence of sea level change. Scientists are keen to point out that this area is tectonically very active. I just wonder whether the rather more in-your-face towering volcano that is Mount Vesuvius may distract some people from the very real and potentially catastrophic dangers of the Campi Flegri caldera.
I'm off now to visit a vineyard on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius to find out how local farmers are benefiting from living in the shadow of the volcano. I'm here at the Cantina del Vesuvio and this is a vineyard and it's on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. And Mount Vesuvius is over there in the distance, not really so far away. And one of the interesting things about it, it's very green. And the reason for that is because the soils are extremely fertile. Local guide Paolo is now going to tell me more about the vineyard. So Paolo, can you tell me a little bit more about the vineyard and why it's here? Well, Simon, as you've seen coming here, the volcano is all surrounded by vineyards. And this specific one exists since the 1940s because they found it here, you know, the best soil to grow grapes. But it, it strikes me as being a very strange place, you know, a crazy place, some people might say, to have farms so close to an active volcano. It is crazy to everybody but Neapolitans, you know, because Neapolitans are used to it. Uh, people here have been living with the volcano on their shoulders for millenniums, so they now live together with it. It's something they just, uh, you know, deal with every day. Uh, and, it's, and it's primarily because the fertility of the soil is so, so good, the soils are so rich, yes. that it makes it an ideal place to grow. Yeah, and not only, you know, we have a, such a good climate, the view is fantastic, the sea is so close, so people find it here whatever they need it always. Yeah. Can you tell me one thing I've noticed here um, are that there are roses that are growing um, along each of the kind of lines of, of the vines. Can you tell me why the roses are here? Because they are disease detectors. It means, you know, they grow only organic products here so they can't use any pesticide. So by looking at the roses, if there is a, a disease affecting the soil, they will be the first one to get it. And so they will be, you know, aware about it after. I see. Can you finally, can you tell me something about the, I gather the name of the vineyard is, uh, is quite important, tells us a little bit about the yeah. kind of people's feelings about the volcano. Would you like to tell me about that? Yeah, you know, the, the wine they, they produce here is called Lacrima Christi which means Jesus Christ tears. And that shows already, you know, the, the, the relationship between the people and the volcano, because it comes after a story that tells that once Jesus was sitting right up there on the crater of Mount Vesuvius, and looking down below, he saw this beautiful bay, and he thought that he might have been a piece of heaven stolen by Lucifer when he fell down on earth. But he suddenly realized he could never have that place back with him because it belonged to human beings. And then he started to cry. So when the tears dropped on the field, they gave birth to the grapes. Despite the clear benefits of living in a volcanic area and the philosophy of the local people to live life for today, volcanic activity is a real threat. And sometime in the future, maybe next year or maybe in a thousand years time, one of the volcanoes in this region will erupt again. It's now time for me to leave Mount Vesuvius and the Bay of Naples and head south to Sicily. I'm on the island of Sicily now on the flanks of Mount Etna. And Mount Etna you can see in the distance behind me. All around me is lava and this lava flowed down the flanks of Mount Etna in 2002. We in England think about lava as a, as a threat because we're not used to it, but in actual fact it moves relatively slowly. So the people here don't see it as a major threat. It will destroy buildings, um, it will flatten trees, but it doesn't really pose a major threat to the people themselves. In fact, the local people call this mountain the Gentle Giant because it provides volcanic soils, fertile soils for farming. It provides rocks like, like this, which are really good for building and it brings tourists into the area. I'm looking forward to finding out more about Mount Etna, about the lava flows and also about the way it's impacted on people's lives. Sicily lies directly on the boundary of the two tectonic plates, with the African plate in the south subducting beneath the Eurasian plate in the north. Scientists believe that the lower part of the African plate has become detached from the main plate, creating what is called a slab window. The magma produced here is relatively low in silica, so is much more fluid than the magma beneath Mount Vesuvius. This explains why the eruptions of Mount Etna tend to be less violent and usually involve extensive flows of lava 
rather than ash clouds and pyroclastic flows. I'm with uh, my guide Vincenzo who is going to tell me more about uh, what has happened here. Uh, Vincenzo, this is a very dramatic area. Uh, we're on a lava flow here. Um, it took place in 2002. Can you tell me a little bit more about what happened? So this is 2002-2003 eruption. The eruption started 23rd October in the morning, very, very, very early. So how long did the lava flow actually last for? You know, how many days or weeks did it go on for? Uh, this eruption uh, took almost one month. Sir. I understand that the lava flow damaged some buildings here and destroyed some buildings. Everything, everything. Hotels and shops, ski station was, uh, uh, I mean, the first, the first lift chair was destroyed. I'm standing on the 2002 lava flow and you can see behind me where it all began, high up there in the mountains. And you can see behind me the, the rivers uh, of lava, the way it flowed down. Some of the lava was coming down behind me, some of it came to the, to the side of me and, and round and down the mountain. You can also see behind me there are a number of buildings and those buildings, they replace the older concrete buildings that were destroyed. And the interesting thing about those new shops is that they are movable. So that were there to be another eruption here, those buildings could be literally picked up, moved somewhere else so they are not really in danger of a future eruption. I wanted to take a closer look at the buildings destroyed by the 2002 eruption. This is the roof of the Birch Hotel, one of several buildings in the area that was destroyed by the 2002 lava flow. I had hoped to climb to the summit of Mount Etna but the area was deemed to be too dangerous following a small eruption just a few weeks before my visit. Although this most recent eruption was relatively small scale, it hit the headlines when a small isolated steam eruption beneath the lava flow injured several people, including a BBC film crew who were filming in the area at the time. Hot volcanic bombs rained down on people, burning jackets and hitting some of them on the head, including the volcano guide Pepe Bargagallo. I met up with Pepe in a hailstorm at the top of the mountain and asked him what had happened back in March 2017. Yes, I remember this big fountain of pyroclastic materials and um, a volcanic bomb that hit my head. Do you want to can see, I see, can see it? Can yeah. see your head? I, yeah. yeah. Oh wow, look at that, goodness me, so actually yes. you, you got a rock landed on your head? Yeah. And, 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 uh, and were you okay? Uh, no, yes, but I've lost a lot of blood. And, uh, Did you have I stitches? Had, yeah, 10 stitches. And uh, I remember that a lot of pyroclastic materials burned our jackets and, and bags. It's my job, so it doesn't matter. It was an, uh, a big experience for me. I bet it was. <laughs> <laughs> Having come all this way to see a recent lava flow, I wanted Pepe to find me some hot rocks. This is rather bizarre because I'm here in a hailstorm um, next to what I can only describe as very hot rocks. I'm now actually on that lava flow that flowed down here in March. It's now um, kind of early May. Um, Pepe, can you tell me what's uh, happening here? Yes, um, inside, underneath, um, it's still hot. And uh, here you can feel the warm uh, because inside the temperature is around 100, 150 degrees Celsius. And you saw, you were here when it erupted um, and you saw this river of, of lava flowing through here. Yes, um, I, I was on the Hephazid mouth when the magma came out was like a river. It was very, very fast, and very, very fluid. And the temperature on the Hephazid point it was around 1,000 degrees Celsius. I'm now at a place known as the uh, Valley of the Ox. And uh, this is essentially a huge kind of uh, depression, really, uh, where most of the lava flows from this particular crater tend to end up. And it's an extraordinary landscape of uh, this black in colour and has got kind of 
punch holes really where little kind of craters have formed. I mean essentially we talk about Etna as being you know a volcano but really it's a, it's a very wide huge mountain that's just got a whole load of craters and a lot of you know volcanoes within volcanoes really. It's a fascinating landscape. Travelling back down the mountain Vincenzo is keen to show me one of the many lava tubes that have been exposed on the flanks of the volcano. So Vincenzo, can you tell me what this feature is and how it was formed? So this is a lava tube that uh, was formed uh, by lava itself during this uh, huge eruption in 1792. Simply lava creates a stream. On the right and left side, lava starts accumulating form like two walls, they join the middle, creating that we call a donkey back. Uh, it's like a lava roof. Lava uh, go on inside this tube, that is, could be like an oven. This is a, a huge uh, lava tube. Sometimes on Etna we have lava tubes that they can get uh, long distance, like uh, uh, one kilometer. Lava tubes are popular tourist attractions on Mount Etna as are the many buildings partly destroyed by historic lava flows. Local volcanologist Salvatore Scudero took me to see a house destroyed by the 1983 eruption. So Salvatore, what's happened here? Here, this little house was destroyed in 1983 by a huge lava flow. There was something very special about that lava flow, wasn't there, in terms of people trying to divert it? Yeah, the local government tried to divert the lava flow. It was the first time here reported on Mount Etna. And uh, what did they do? They drilled some hole in the lateral side of the lava flow and put some explosive inside, but they failed. It didn't work? It didn't work. <laughs> In 1981, a major eruption of Mount Etna produced an extensive lava flow to the north of the volcano that threatened the nearby town of Randazzo. Over a period of just a few days, lava devastated forests, cultivated land, vineyards and houses, interrupting roads, railways and cutting power and telephone lines. The lava flow threatened the historic house and vineyards here at the Fattori Romeo del Castello. Fortunately, the house and much of the vineyards were saved as the lava flow swept around the contours down to the Alcantara River. I met up with the owner of the vineyard to find out more about what happened. Chiara, can you tell me what happened when the volcano erupted in 1981? Yes, the eruption started uh, very low, not from the top of the volcano. The lava flow arrived uh, until uh, here, destroying cultivated land, wood and 20 hectares of our uh, estate. And your, your mother was here at the time. Can you tell me, were you frightened? Were you scared? We were not afraid for our persons because the lava flow is very slow. But we, we were afraid for the property, for the houses, but the buildings and the most part of property was safe. And now we could continue our activity. Close family friend Stefano Branca a scientist from the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology, joined us to explain more about what happened in 1981. Stefano, can you tell me why this eruption happened at such a low elevation? A typical uh, eruption on Etna volcano are uh, occurred at the summit of, uh, of the volcano, but sometimes uh, uh, when the accumulation of the, the magma within the main conduit increase in time, uh, occurred uh, a phenomenon uh, called magma intrusion. The, the magma so uh, broken the, the rocks of, uh, along the flanks of the volcano, and in this case uh, may occur the opening of uh, very long eruptive fissure uh, along the slopes uh, up uh, to lower uh, elevation as the case of uh, 1981 eruption. Tell me how fast the lava flow moved and what sort of temperature it was? This event was a very fast eruption uh, on Etna. It lasted on the wool six uh, days, uh, so very short, uh, short period. 
The temperature of the lava flow of the Etna lava flow is uh, more or less 1,200 degrees. The lava flow uh, moves very fast, uh, more or less uh, on average uh, 100 uh, meters uh, in an hour uh, during the first uh, phase of, of the eruption. And so people would have been able to walk away from the lava flow? Yes, in any case, lava flow uh, are not dangerous for uh, for the people. Uh, for the people, it's dangerous the the explosive uh, the explosive activity. Uh, in this case, uh, eruption at low elevation are uh, very dangerous for the cultivated land and for the urban fabric. Uh, like uh, this, like uh, here. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is a beautiful example. I wanted to see where the lava flow finally came to a halt. So we walked downhill through the vineyard to the banks of the Alcantara River. I'm at the furthest point that the lava flow got to back in 1981 and this is the Alcantara River behind me and the lava flowed down past the vineyard, round the side of the vineyard and then down to this point and it ended up here right by the shores of the Alcantara River. I'm on my way to the Alcantara Gorge it's one of the most spectacular landforms in this part of Sicily and it's where the Alcantara River cuts through the lava flows. This is the Alcantara River, a little bit further downstream than where we were earlier back at the vineyard. And here the river is cutting its way through some old lava flows to create waterfalls and gorges. This is the Alcantara Gorge and this is where the Alcantara River comes out from the gorge behind me and spreads out into a wide valley. And you can see on the sides of the gorge itself there are the jointing structures known as columnar jointing as the basalt has cooled. And this particular river is very, very popular. This spot is very popular in the summer um, for local people who come here to enjoy the refreshingly cool water uh, in the very hot summer days. The final leg of my journey takes me to Volcano, one of the eight volcanic Aeolian islands, about 25 kilometers off the northeast coast of Sicily. Volcano is one of two active volcanic islands in the archipelago, the other being Stromboli. The Aeolian islands form a volcanic island arc at the destructive plate boundary between the African and the Eurasian plates and have been formed over a period of some 260,000 years. I've climbed up to the summit of Gran Cretere, which last erupted between 1888 and 1890, and all around me is scientific monitoring equipment keeping a close eye on this volcano. This volcano here on the island of Volcano is very carefully monitored. It wasn't very long ago when it last erupted, and scientists are monitoring it to just make sure that it's safe and if they need to evacuate people then they can do so. And in this volcano they're measuring the gas, they're measuring deformation, looking for changes in the shape of the volcano. There are also, there's also infrared cameras in here that are looking for temperature changes as well. So in lots of respects this particular volcano is very, very carefully monitored by scientists. I met up with local guide Manuela to find out more about the volcano. Manuela, can you tell me more about the eruption? Yes, it was a big explosion with a mushroom cloud sending materials, lepils, all around the area and also down near the village. So the people living down here are presumably at risk from a future eruption? Absolutely, yes, because we have a lot of people, especially in summer period, that are staying here and they don't have the feeling that it's still a dangerous volcano. That's the reason why it's crazy to stay in the area. Volcano is popular with tourists, many of whom hike to the summit of the volcano. Some then choose to enjoy the natural mud pools and hot springs near the harbour. Having seen the volcano monitoring equipment on Vesuvius and Gran Cratere, I now want to see what the volcanic data looks like and how it's interpreted by scientists. So I'm going back to Sicily to see where data is displayed for Mount Etna. On the screen behind me here is, is displayed the information that is monitored on Mount Etna. There are real-time camera images, there are thermal camera images as well, and we've got over here there are earthquakes. And all this information is used by scientists to help them predict when the volcano is likely to erupt. 
And down here is, is more information. This is real-time information. And I have a volcano expert, Salvatore, who is going to tell me what is happening here. Well, Simon, the green signals here is the movement of magma and gases inside the volcano. Look, in the last two days, nine peaks. Etna tried to erupt, but it uh, didn't happen yet. It was really exciting to see the spikes on the graph suggesting that Etna was about to erupt, but rather disappointing that it didn't go through with it. Nonetheless, it was impressive to see the volcano being monitored and to understand a bit more about what scientists are looking for. It's been fascinating spending time here in southern Italy and I've learnt a lot about the volcanoes. Whilst they continue to pose a very real threat to the people living in the area, they also bring great benefits and somehow the people just carry on with their everyday lives. If you have the opportunity, I'd really encourage you to visit Naples or Sicily for yourself. Smell the sulphur, taste the local produce, appreciate the size of the craters, and understand what it's really like to live in the shadow of volcanoes.